All right, our first guest is an actor, writer, and more. He wrote and starred and directed in the Ben Stiller show, which he was also a co-creator on. He's graced the camera in a number of Ben Stiller vehicles, such as Reality Bites, The Cable Guy, and of course Tropic Thunder, among other non-Stiller-related productions that we'll definitely get into. Uh, Jeff, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. Is the first guest more important than the second guest in this show? Absolutely. Every time. Okay. Yes. <laughs> cut, cut that part out. As long as that's defined, because this is this is top tier talent show right here. Yeah. Now, Mr. Khan, of course, you acted in a few things in the late 80s, but it seems like you really found your place with the creation of The Ben Stiller Show in 1989. And you do go on to work with Ben Stiller again throughout the years. So a lot of people want to know, did your involvement on that show stem from a prior relationship with Ben or did it kind of just the, the relationship like during the show? Did you guys just build from there? Where is the epicenter of that thing happening? The, the genesis. A lot, when you say a lot of people want to know, is that like the Trump? A lot of people. Just me and him. No, just me, just me and him. Okay. Just me and him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so speaking to you two guys, <laughs> who seem to want to know things that nobody else in the world wants to know. Um, I, I Ben. I met Ben in 1986 at John Cusack's house that he was renting on Outpost in L.A. while he was shooting Say Anything. I was, uh, everybody was there. Uh, somehow we all ended up in John Cusack's rented house on Outpost. Joan, his sister, uh, DV, uh, Steve Pink, who's the director, DV, DV Census, who wrote um, the OJ Simpson show that he got an Emmy for, uh, Joan Cusack, his sister. Uh, Lily Taylor was there. Um, who, who, and, and, uh, uh, who else came by? Um, Pam Siegel, Pam Abdon, Winona Ryder came over. It's like, he was like this weird. And then Ben showed up and I didn't know who he was. I, we were all kind of, they were in the movie like Jeremy Piven and stuff were in Say Anything and I kind of wanted to be in Say Anything and I was there because I had never been to LA before and John invited me out to hang out and I was trying to get an agent. Uh, I, had, I had met an agent in Chicago where I was living, who told me to come out to LA and that he would send me out on commercials. So I got there, I went to the agent's agency um, after I made a time with them to meet them. And I got there and I waited for about 40 minutes and I finally said, what's going on? And they said, you know, um, it's a tough time right now and uh, they're not gonna see you. And I said, what, well, I came all the way out to, Los Angeles to meet this guy <laughs> told me he was going to send me out and I met him through my agent. So it wasn't like, it wasn't, it was right at, you know, it was legit to me. Yeah. And uh, they said, well, there's been a writer's strike. I said, well, I'm not, I'm doing a commercials, which is not affected by it. And they said, I'm oh, sorry, this is, this is, you know, we're really sorry. I said, well, I'm not leaving until you see me. There you go. Right. So then they got security and kicked me out. But anyway. <laughs> you made your point. You made your yeah, point. Made my point. Couldn't they so have at least sent an email? <laughs> there was no emails in 1986. Okay. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they sent a smoke signal to me, but I missed it on my way over there. <laughs> ben had did a, did a movie with John. Can't remember what the movie was. Um, he had a small part in it. And so he came out because he was meeting his big time agents, William Morris from New York. And we and John paired us up to, to live in the same room of this very large house. And I was like, okay, whatever. I didn't know who he was. And Ben was like dressed in a Hugo Boss suit. I'm like, dude, you're 22. You know, no, we're all like dressed in shorts and cut off t-shirts. It's the 80s. You know, we're just like in sneakers and this guy's walking around in a suit. I was like, I don't know who he is, but I don't like him. <laughs> I don't like this guy. He's weird. He's got too many suits for his age. And he like says, no offense, but I don't want to share a room with you. I'm like, well, fuck you. I was here first. So he just, so he, I'm like, oh, fine. Take, take the room, Hugo boss. And uh, I'll go sleep in the, 
in another room on the couch. I mean, it's free and we're in LA and we're in our twenties. Like what's the big deal? So we didn't, I didn't like him. And, you know, and he didn't seem to like me very much, but somehow, I don't know, he just, I think he liked the fact that I didn't like him. Like it appealed to him that I didn't know who he was mm-hmm. and I didn't care. Cause I'm like, I'm in my own like world of like, you know, getting thrown out of agencies and not getting in movies. So I'm very, I'm busy. Right. <laughs> I'm super busy. And, and Ben is like, you know, he's in his own thing. And I don't know, I made him laugh. Um, I did Woody Allen impressions for him. He said, I look like a, a cross between Brian Setzer and Woody Allen. And he's made fun of me and how I looked in the 80s, which was laughable. And I made fun of him. And I think we sort of bonded on that. And I went back to Chicago, triumphantly, of course, without an agent or hmm. getting in a movie. And um, resumed my life there. I was living at the time with um, a really great actor, uh, Harry Lennox. And then Ben came to Chicago to shoot a movie called Next to Kin with Liam Neeson. And um, he just didn't have much to do for like three months. So he um, got some guy to give him money to shoot a short film, which he was doing at the time, shooting shorts. And then the guy said, here's some more money. He's a gangster, by the way, this guy, okay. uh, a Chicago gangster guy. And he said, here's some more money. Make it into a half hour and we'll, and we'll sell it to Rhino Video. And he said, oh, sure. And then he asked me, you know, we were sort of hanging out. He said, do you want to expand this little movie into a half hour and cast everybody you know who will do it for free and we'll make it and it'll be, a, you know, for Rhino Video. I don't even know anything else with Rhino Video is anymore, but it's just like specialized thing. And it was like a half hour comedy. We shot it on 35 millimeter and cut it together like this with the thing and taped it together with an editor. That's how long ago this is, but everybody's in this movie. Mike Myers is in the movie. Jeremy Piven's in the movie. John Cusack's in the movie. Um, uh, 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 Joel Murray is in the movie. Dave, uh, Dave Pasquese is in the movie. Uh, uh, Andy Dick is in the movie. That's how Ben met Andy Dick. So, cause they were all my friends. Um, we had such a, you know, a pretty positive time making this film together and a lot of laughs. And he said, move to New York and we'll do stand up together. And I go, well, I have no money. I have no agent. And um, so he said, live with me. So mm. I did. Talk about a turn on the tables there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah to yeah. go from not wanting to be a roommate to being a housemate. To be a roommate. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What was that? What, so, what was the was, short called that you guys did? The short film. It's called Elvis Stories. Elvis uh, Stories. I'm, I'm, it's it's pretty funny. It it might hold up. It's about people who have paranormal Elvis experiences. Nice. <laughs> and it's completely farcical and silly. It's shot in vignettes, and each vignette is a different person who has these odd uh, Elvis. Uh, paranormal experiences um so i I don't know if you can still get that movie but it was uh it was really fun to make and it's pretty funny yeah i mean with that many with all those people in it yeah and they were all i mean we're all like young and in our 20s uh uh, john's brother billy is in the movie he's very funny in it um in this thing with um in this vignette with uh andy dick and that's how that's how ben met andy because i worked with andy at a deli uh, above the uh, at the top of the water tower in Chicago, and we were both fired <laughs> from that. Um, yeah. I, I was fired because I was the worst waiter of all time, and Andy was fired for giving out free food to his friends. Nice, yeah, that's an that's an uh, that's an admirable. Fire for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, and so how that's how that's that? how that started. And from doing stand up with Ben, like doing like a team. Um, we developed characters, um, things that he had been working on, things that I'd been working on, and we sort of combined them. And that's how we started to do, you know, you two. He did Bono and I did The Edge, or I did, um, he did Eddie Munster and I, you know, played like a straight man, or we did uh, a thing called Rap Mitzvah, which is a, was a rap to, uh, was two Bar Mitzvah boys rapping in their Bar Mitzvahs, which was, I guess, cutting edge in the, uh, latest of 80s, earliest of 90s. Um, and from, from that, um, 
MTV gave, wanted to work with us, gave us a little bit of money to make uh, what they called It's Your Hour, because they were branching. MTV at the time was all videos. I know it's hard to believe, but it was all music videos. And they wanted to branch into scripted TV, uh, particularly comedy. So they gave a few people very little money to go and shoot, guerrilla shoot, you know, like on their own um, little comedy sketches or vignettes that, and then edit it and give it to them and they would air it with videos in between. And so they liked it, what we did. We did, we did a rap mitzvah, rap mitzvah video. We did a few other things that were funny. And um, they said, well, why don't you guys do a, a Ben and Jeff show? And I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a show with my name in it. And then I was, and I was working at Remote Control at the time. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Does anybody remember Remote Control? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So I was, that was my first real like paying job. And I was working in remote control and I get a call from my manager who is none other than Lori Leonard, who becomes Lori David, Larry David's wife. Wow. Okay. Oh. Another story. I know everybody who's made it very, very big. You are the yeah. conjunction yeah. to our entertainment. Right. So there's me nowhere. And then there's all these amazing people who've come from this connection, like Bob Odenkirk and Andy Dick and, and Laurie Leonard and, and Ben and just, just everybody, who, you know, uh, Dave Cross, like anybody's like been around me has done really well. So that's what I tell my students now. Stick with me for a little while. You're going to be great. Now question, does this bode well for our show now? Yeah. Okay. okay. The more you okay. have, right. the more you have me on, the less I will become and the better and more famous you will be. But you have to have me on for a certain amount of time to pay your Jeff Con dues. Thank you. Show business. <laughs> and once you've depleted me of all of my, everything I can give to you and I have nothing to show for it, that's when you guys make it. Yeah, right. Showtime is going to call us any day saying, we want the, we want the yeah, Dirt we want and the Royal show. and Jeff show, show, but it's only going to be the Dirt and the Royal show. <laughs> right. We don't want Jeff Kahn. <laughs> so I'm like working. I get a call from Lori Leonard who says, hold on to your hats. MTV wants to do the Ben and Jeff show. And I'm like, this is like, it, this is like, to me, it was the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. I just thought like all of the 10 years or whatever, almost decade that I had spent trying to get to this moment was all worth it. And I could barely digest it when the phone rang again. And it was one of the MTV executives who said, Hey, um, I know you've heard the good news. I just want you to know that it's not going to be the Ben and Jeff show. It's just going to be the Ben Stiller show, but you're welcome to be on it. So <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, well, that's that's more befitting of, of what my reality is. So um, it became the Ben Stiller show, but I, I, it was just Ben and I, and this other very funny, very good actor, Harry O'Reilly. Um, and it was just us doing a show within a show, which I always love. Uh, we were putting on a Ben Stiller show for MTV, who had made us play videos in the middle of our show. And we got to do all these different sketches and all these different worlds and basically do anything we wanted to do. So it was artistically, it was really fun. And we did a show that parodied Fox shows at the time. I sent the tape to Joe DiVola, who used to be an MTV executive, who was now an ex executive at Fox. He saw the tape and he offered Ben a, a pilot. Well, he offered us a pilot deal to write a pilot for the Fox show. And that's how it sort of, um, uh, morphed from the MTV show into the to the Fox um, MTV show, uh, the Fox Ben Stiller show. The full circle of that is pretty pretty beautiful. How it goes from not wanting to share a room with you to not sharing not a title share with a you. Show with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still being you now, all the way. So, being you, all the way. Was that? Did, do you know what? Why that decision was made? Did, did, was there any light shed on that? You know, look, it's made because. In, in show business, you know, there's certain realities and it's not that the MTV executive was super nice, a very good friend of mine and um, very supportive of me, gave me a job writing a pilot 
for a talk show that I, you know, my first pilot, I gave me $500, but anyway, it was my first professional job. Um, a lovely person. Um, but they wanted to work with Ben, you know, and Ben didn't want to be a stellar, a stellar and mirror. You know, he wanted to be, he wanted his own show. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't want to be a, a comedy team. I mean, he had grown up with a comedy team and, you know, and, and in, in that way, I can't blame him. Right. right. I mean, I'm not there. They're not offering a show to Jeff Kahn, really. They're offering a show because they want Ben Stiller to be on their network. It yeah. so happens that he's working with me. So, you know, I had never done anything before, really, of, you know, of note other than, you know, doing commercials or being in vice versa in a small scene, you know, and doing improv and being on, I mean, I worked hard and I, you know, I did a lot of work, but I, I didn't have a resume to speak of. That was a, was a, a large resume. That's a tough pill to swallow. I mean, I, even from an independent filmmaking standpoint, I've had agents and um, distributors say, we love the movie. We love the script. We love everything about it. It's not going to go anywhere because there's no name in it. Right. That's a real reality right now. Right. Mm -hmm. OK, so it's a little bit less of a reality then, but it's still a reality, which means they want to work with the the person who presents the star, you know, the, the draw of the show. Right. Mm -hmm. So even when you're making a TV show now, there's all of these outlets. There's tons of places that are looking for content, but they have their pick of the litter. If they, yeah. you know, to them, they want Reese Witherspoon. They don't want like an unknown star or whatever okay. to star in their show. And this is happens in the movies too, because how are they going to sell an independent movie in today's marketplace if they don't have a marquee name? Mm -hmm. And it's too bad because it, it really hurts what these things should be doing, which is television and indie movies should be promoting new talent to reach a new audience. Yeah, It should. Yeah. Yeah, but they the don't. lesson the lessons are not learned because TV keeps finding new talent, um, but they still keep wanting to only cast you know established stars to star in it. It's tough. I know exactly what you're saying because the independent movie and the and the trying to create a pilot for TV, which I've been you know which I still do, you really need. They really say, who's the star of the show? How do you get them? Let me ask you a quick question. Would you think, do you think that correlates into voice acting? Because I'm a voice actor as well. And what I've noticed when I was younger, it was anybody's voice. It was who, pretty much who had the best voice and they were selling the best commercials. Now I'm hearing uh, Ed O'Neill on, on these like the internet commercials. I'm hearing John Kaczynski on commercials. I'm like, don't you guys already have enough money? I mean, I love what you do, but don't take it all. Like, I mean, what are your thoughts? I know that's not in our questions, I but. Know, I know. You know, that voice, I've known a lot of voiceover actors and that's been a complaint from, from the get-go. I know you know, and there is, there might've been more, I did some voiceover in Chicago. There might've been more of an openness to it, but for, the, for major products, uh, like for instance, Jeremy Pibben's dad was a very well-known voiceover actor, had a beautiful voice. He's always warming it up. Tia. Um, um, excuse me. Uh, so he's constantly warming up his voice and it's all about his voice. Mm -hmm. um, but he would say like, why are they, why is Ed O'Neill doing this thing when it should be me? Burn Pivot. <laughs> Everybody wants Burn Pivot's voice. <laughs> it's like, what, you know, they, they want Ed O'Neill. Well, you know, they want they want the recognizable voice because unconsciously people hear that voice and say like, hmm, there's a voice I, 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 I know for some reason. Maybe I should buy this product. I agree with you. Like, what's the, you know, why they can pay him $2 million. They pay you, you know, $25 and change. You do it. But, and you do have a great voice, by the way. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Khan. He yeah, does. Really good he doesn't need to. Keep doing. He's I, doing it. I think I will. Thank you because J JK said so. I'm going to do it. Thank you, sir. I, I do. I truly appreciate, it and I truly do. Thank you. I don't know if you can see the poster in the back that says King Humble. He, he has a bit of an ego issue. So I'm working he, on he, it. He does not need the compliments. I'm working on it, Jeff. I'm working no, on no, it. You, should, you need the ego, actually, because because <laughs> otherwise you get you get blown to bits. Yes. The problem with ego is what do you do after? you make it, yeah, yeah, when, yeah, when, yeah, it sure. when, when you can't rein it in. 
What, why are you looking at me? I I've never got there far. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the uh, I, I I get why why movies and and TV shows do that. I mean, and I think largely it's the fault of the general audience because what's the first thing that somebody says when you say, "Have you seen this movie?" Who's, who's in, in it? it? Yeah. yeah. Who's in it? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So hope. I, I mean, well, I I get where they're coming from, but I. Yeah, I guess you can only hope as a struggling actor to get on one of those vehicles and then be able to bridge from a supporting to a lead eventually because yeah. people then know you. It's, you know what, you have to think of yourself like a stock, yeah. right? So you, you need a portfolio, right? You need, and, yeah. and, and once you have established the viability of your stock as something that makes money, that generates commerce, then, mm -hmm. and that's cynical, maybe cynical, but I'm just, I'm, I, I don't feel cynical saying it, but I just feel like that's the reality of, of a marketplace because people yeah. are looking at Netflix going like, I don't know what to choose. There's eight bajillion things here. Oh, I know that person, right? Mm -hmm. That's um, uh, David Polinsky's uh, other name or whatever. <laughs> what is your name? I don't know any of your names except for David. <laughs> but what is your, all your names? Tarian and Durden. Yes. Maybe you should just pick a name and stick with it, you know, or just be a, be a one name guy. One name guys are the best. I can't because David Petlansky still has to land regular jobs and they don't like <laughs> what Durden Godfrey does on the side. <laughs> they don't they don't appreciate you having a passion beyond the nine to five that they're asking no, they you don't. to. It's so funny. It's it I I you know, I'm a teacher now and uh, a lot of my students, my pilot writing students, this is what they write about. You know, this exact, this, this thing, and it's always been a thing. It's like, how do you negotiate your aspirations and still try to survive in the, in the world? It doesn't get old mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, just how you execute that pilot to make it compelling. Yeah. At least now with YouTube, you can feel like you've made it before you've actually made it in a sense. That's true. And, and, and there is, that is the place where the unknown becomes the known. Right, you do actually have a place. Now. Which and now the A listers that were take that that drove people to YouTube are, are now on jumping YouTube. on YouTube on and YouTube. taking YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't even get me started on that. That's a whole. Well, it's called greed, <laughs> and that's what that's what motors capitalism. Yeah, I mean to 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 brush off a little of the cynicism of the conversation. It, we all are all aware it takes a lot of money to make a movie, so you know there's no. Yeah, that too. Yeah. Hire us. Um, so do you have a favorite skit from the Ben Stiller show? The, the, the Ben and Jeff show? Well, I, I guess I have favorites from both shows. It, when we were, we did like a 25 year reunion or something or a 20 year reunion. And they asked that question. And, and, and I think Judd, Judd, was, Judd, Judd was the monitor. Judd Apatow was, uh, and, and Ben was there and Andy. Bob Odenkirk was on a screen. And I was there and Rob Cohn, a very, very great uh, sketch writer and writer in general, and now a really good director. And Janine, they asked us that question. And um, so from the show, from the, from the Fox show, I, you know, I, I always loved Manson Lassie so much because I just felt it was such a clear idea. It was so Odenkirkian is what I would mm -hmm. say. Like it was really cerebral, but that it, with the, but in the execution, it was just so nailed. Like it was smart, but it was silly and it was funny and it, and it was shot in black and white. So it had sort of a patina of, of, of the old TV shows, you know, and the feeling of that. And it just, it just always, lo I just loved it. I just thought it was like, it was just such a gem. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a lot of them. You know, I mean, I certainly loved making the, the sketches that that I was involved in, which tended to be kind of more musical. So they were really fun for me because I got to edit them and uh, put them together, cast them and, you know, do like U2 stuff or do the, you know. So Bob, uh, to pay to play it forward, said that he loved the Grungies, which was um, which was my sketch of a mashup between um seattle 90s grunge and the 60s monkeys show <clears throat> both nice. so dated now that it's unbelievable <laughs> it's like it's so like so old 
Uh, so I don't know if that stands the test of time, but um, it sure was fun to, it was sure fun to do. It was a little bit of my childhood, right? In the, that I could be nostalgic about writing, but also like right in the moment of, you know, when grunge music was all the rage. And in the original Ben Stiller show, there's a, there were so many fun little crazy things. I got to do a, a sketch where I was, was supposed to be my audition reel where I got to take off all my clothes and do a monologue from Equus. Hmm. I always liked that one because I because it, it fulfilled my lifelong dream of being nude in front of the camera. <laughs> Uh, and doing was, and doing an Equus monologue. <laughs> <laughs> was there was a sock in play for that? No, I just there was a there was a very a small chair. <laughs> that's, that's all I needed. <laughs> so you, uh, you you talked about remote control. That was your first being like your first job, your real job. Right. Did you was there? How, how long were you writing prior to that? I came out of improv, so I I was in an improv group in college with a lot of really great people, including my roommate, who was Joan Cusack, um, and some other people that ended up at Second City and having interesting careers like Holly Wartell and Evan Gore and um, a uh, Academy Award-winning director uh, for short documentaries, Eric Simonson. Um, a bunch of, uh, we were all great friends. And then we moved down sh to Chicago to, to, to be in an improv group there uh, to continue sort of what we were doing in college. But I, because we needed to do a show every Tuesday, there's a certain amount where it was improvised and then there was a certain sort of sketch element to it. And so I was really drawn to the sketch element to it. Uh, and even though I didn't, you wouldn't say I wrote the sketch out, I would outline the sketch um, so I knew what I wanted and what I wanted the actors in the sketch to do. So I sort of gave them lines or I gave them through lines or I gave a beginning and middle and end. So I learned how to write by, by having to do this show every Tuesday. And I wanted to generate new material all the time um, for the cast and also myself to create characters, mm -hmm. um, you know, to fulfill my dream of never getting on SNL. And so that's how I, that's how I no learned worries. how to write. And from that, expanding that sort of idea into what I was doing with Ben to do vignettes for that movie. And then start, that, that sort of, it's like a, an evolution of learning how to write sort of by writing itself. Get, so get I had not TV. written for a TV show before, Remote yeah. Control, but I had written a pilot for a talk show which was very written out, even, you know, even the monologue. Um, yeah. So I sort of learned as I went along, but I had to do it every week. Yeah, that's, that, that's, I mean, that's a good way to stay in practice. So now a lot of people, they'll say this, they'll say, Hey, listen, it's nothing wrong with following your dreams and right. doing what you love, but until you get paid for it, you're just a glorified intern. Now that's some people say that. So let me ask you this. How long was it before when you were putting your name to stuff and get it out of there? Did it turn from doing what you love to actually now I'm getting paid for it? Yeah. I, I, I look at my time at MTV as, as my interning years. Because they didn't pay. Shit. Okay. Right. So we, uh, I guess my first real writing gig, I mean, that I was supposedly being paid for was a um, special, an hour special, a half hour special for Colin Quinn, who was one of the stars of Remote Control and a brilliant comedian mm -hmm. um, and a very good actor. So he wanted to, he was like, you know, he was bored with remote control in a way and he wanted to do more stuff. And so they teamed him up with Ben and I, and we wrote the Colin Quinn back to Brooklyn special. Mm -hmm. And I was paid nothing. In fact, I was at whatever I was going to be paid because of the cost that it, it was costing MTV to make this thing right. And it's really funny and it's probably still watchable even, even if it's a little bit dated because of just how, just, it was just funny. Mm -hmm. um, and Colin is great and Ben is in it. And, you know, there's a bunch of different, you know, uh, and mirrors in it and um, 
trying to think if there's any, there's a bunch of different comedians in it. And um, it's just, it was great fun to do. Um, but it cost a lot for MTV. They were, you know, and, and to subsidize the cost, they asked us to throw our salaries in. So I got paid nothing for months and months of work, you know, even doing some acting and, you know, it, but I viewed it as like, you know what? I'm learning. Right. I'm learning how to write. I'm learning how to produce a television show. I'm learning what it takes to do a short movie. Um, I'm helping in casting. I'm helping in develop. It's like, where else am I going to learn this? All right. Yeah. So they're not paying me, but they're giving me this amazing opportunity to get something on the air. I think mm -hmm. the idea that we're owed a career is probably the wrong way to go about it. It's an honor for them to people who have the money to give you their money to make your artistic vision into a reality. If we yeah. look at it like that, instead of looking at like, oh, come on, I'm so great, you know, and give yourself some time to learn your craft before, you know, you make all, you know, your money, you know, eventually you will, you know, and eventually MTV gave me a job on remote control where they actually paid me. Right. And so I got the experience of doing this thing and MTV ended up giving me this job. And then they gave us the Ben Stiller show. So in some ways I feel, oh, well, you know, barely made any money, but where else am I going to get that experience? Like, and does anybody else have this now? I don't know. I mean, I felt I was lucky. Yeah, that's a great way of looking at it. I mean, there's definitely value and experience and just being right there in the mix of things for doors to open potentially things like that but value doesn't doesn't pay the bills so were you right. like having to supplement your income in other ways while working pretty much full-time on these projects um well once i got a remote control um i was making something of a salary don't forget new york at the time i was renting a one bedroom with my friend uh with a view of central park on 103rd 102nd street in central park west for fourteen hundred dollars, mm. yeah, 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 like what? Right, seven hundred each. So I could afford that, you know. And I lived in when I lived in Chicago, I was paying three hundred for rent. Mm -hmm. wow. You know, splitting a place with Harry Lennox for that was three fifty. This is what we were paying, so I didn't have to, because you know, like the rents in New York and L.A. and here in Boston. I mean, they're so out of control. I mean, I would have had no, I don't know. I, it, I had a different reality. Mm -hmm. Right. I didn't, I didn't have to. Uh, yeah. I had jobs in Chicago as the world's worst waiter to supplement my income. And then I would once in a while get a commercial that brought in considerably more and sort of try to live off of that. But um, as a, you know, doing commercials, like I did five or six commercials and they brought in, a, you know, pretty good money for short periods of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't have, my expenses weren't that, weren't that great. Yeah. That's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Keep it. But it, was there ever a time where it was like, I, let me ask it this way. Did you find it hard to be productive under this, under the stress of if there was stress to like keep the lights on or make rent this month? Did that affect productivity or did it fuel it? No, I just kept getting fired in Chicago <laughs> okay. over and over and over again. I mean, just, I just was just sort of like, just, you know, mm -hmm. getting enough to get through it. And I didn't have, I didn't have to like my kid in LA just moved out. He, my kid is going to be 23 and, um, He's a musician and they just graduated last June. Um, just moved out of Annabelle, my ex, my ex wife's house. Um, and he's, they have to pay a thousand dollars a month rent. I never, I never had to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, Whoa, that is just, you know, and yeah. that's not, that's, that's their share right. oh, of the wow. rent yeah. I paid. $700 and in New York city. And that's when I had a 
a job that paid me enough that I could, you know, it was certainly, I didn't have a lot of stuff, but you know, I was able to get by and eat and keep the lights on. Um, and then I started getting more work after that. I started, Ben and I started to get scripts and started to get paid. And I started to get more money after, after um, the Ben Stiller show on MTV. So, you know, writing a pilot and all that stuff. So, um, and that's like 90, 91. So if I would say that if I graduated in 84, I didn't really make any money to speak of until, you know, 91 almost a decade so i i think i know the answer to this question and quite honestly i'm really just asking it for the soundbite that will hopefully inspire struggling aspiring writers out there but if if the opportunity never came to make this a job uh where you where you can make money where you could pay bills by writing would you right. would you like did you have a do you have like a, a mental thing in your mind? Like if it doesn't happen by this time, I've got to figure something else out. Or would you just, was that never even a question or would you just still never be Never a question for me. Not, not to begin with. Don't, I, I wanted to be an actor, right? So yeah. that, I mean, that's like really oblivious to reality, right? You can't live in reality and want to be an actor because you, you'd be like, this is, this is ridiculous. Who doesn't want to be an actor? You know, yeah. um, and I just wanted it, you know, and I wanted to be on stage and I and I got on stage. I just didn't get paid for it. I did lots of theater in Chicago and I was doing improv all the time. I did stand up comedy. Uh, I was in improv groups. I worked at Second City. Uh, I worked with Del Close. I was performing constantly. You know, there was constant being uh, performing on and off stage, being in plays, doing commercials. Um, I never stopped. Uh, it was hard to, to work a day job with all that stuff because, because I was so focused on trying to make it. Um, and as I said, you know, I was just the worst waiter of all time, easily flustered, terrible in math. Um, just, uh, not interested. I'd go like three days and the people would be like, well, thank you. Yeah, like you're not and trying to work your way shop. up to general manager or anything. Right, you don't right. want to be there. <laughs> sure. I did later in life, to answer the question in retrospect, when I'm not your age, but when I was my age now, and I wasn't getting the work that I used, used to get, and I was like, you know, I have to make a change mm -hmm. for my own sanity. So I went back and got my MFA in creative writing literature at Bennington College and um, graduated in, in 2019. And I've been working on trying to be a teacher for full time, which I really love. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, yeah, I saw that you uh, had a, a page on the teachers. So we'll I'll definitely get into that for sure. Uh, Let me ask you this, Jeff. What do you, what do you tell the, to the writer whose ink is almost dry in their pen or they hit the punch the last thing on their typewriter if kids still have those out there in nine days? Uh, what do you tell that person who's aspiring to be a writer and they're in a the very dark place right now? I mean, I'm not even talking writer's block. I'm talking about they pen three or four scripts. They, they're right. sending out, they're not getting anything and they're just about on the brink of saying, you know what? I gave it all I had, man. What do you tell them? So I was going to say, well, like, you know, I have a lot of students, but I don't really hear that from my students. I don't, you know, either they're in college or they're doing um, post-college sort of, uh, you know, UCLA extension kind of stuff. And uh, I don't really hear that very much from them. I, they seem so hopeful to me. Uh, it kind of maybe that they don't understand what it takes, why, why it's so difficult to create a television show, which is really the hardest thing. The hardest writing in entertainment is not movie writing. It's creating a television show and which makes the pilot actually the hardest script you could possibly write because you have to create entire show and all the characters, the world, the tone, uh, where it's going, uh, the thematic element of your show. I mean, there's so much that goes into it. Um, so much work. Uh, and then from that, you take this little piece of it and you, you try to make the prototype, you know, episode. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Um, if somebody's that frustrated, I'd say like, you know, well, maybe put it aside for a little while. 
I, I'm not sure what it is that I don't know what kind of feedback that they're getting. So, I mean, it's hard to say, it's like a very general question. Like, you know, would I be encouraging? I don't know. I don't know their work. You know, if they're generating material that is unfocused, um, is, uh, confusing to read is overly complicated, uh, is convoluted, uh, in story or character. Uh, I'd say, you know what, maybe you need to take a class. Maybe you need to separate yourself from your aspirations for a while and work on your craft. Mm -hmm. Okay. So maybe you need to do that and then come back to it. Because if you're just writing in a vacuum and the feedback you're getting is not positive, then you have to take that. You have to let it, you have to put your ego aside and say, okay, I really want to do this, but somehow it's not working. So yeah. let me hear what the, the feedback is and let me recalibrate my thinking, take a course or two, get in a writing group and uh, try it all, try it again from a different perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, the only thing you can do as a writer, which beats the hell out of being an actor is that you can keep generating material no matter what you're doing. Yeah, true. Right. Writer. You can always do that. Yeah. Um, but if you keep getting the same feedback or if you keep externalizing, well, it's them, it's not me. You know, I have nothing to learn. I'm so great. Well, maybe it is you. Mm -hmm. Cause I think, you know, what really stands in our way in life the most is our egos. Mm -hmm. you know, and the expectations of our egos. And that's a old man's, you know, who's, who's had his share of ego problems coming at yeah. you right now. The ego is the problem because it shuts you down, mm -hmm. you know, and you stop, you stop understanding that, you know, writing is not a race. It's a process. Mm. Yeah. And there really isn't a good and bad in that process, there's only a better. And that's what yeah. I tell my students. It's not about good and bad right now. It's about how do we get you to better? Yeah. It's a becoming yeah. process. That's really good advice. Not at all what I was expecting. I was right. expecting fluff. That wasn't fluff. Well, that's why I want to wait for fluff. When the ink yeah. is dry, when the time <laughs> you hit the last stroke. <laughs> I'm, not um, a, I'm not really a fluff guy. No, you're not. <laughs> and, 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 and for my students, I think it's kind of hard sometimes because I just give it to them, you know? I, I'm not trying to discourage them. I'm just saying like, you gotta take it now for me because you get out there in the world that no one gives a damn. I care yeah. at least, I care yeah. about you, you know? Like I care about your future, I care about your script and, and, and I'm a, you know, you, use me for that. But I have to give you the reality of the situation. That's the price you have to pay. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, as a, as a teacher, not only, you're not only giving them experience and how to write, but how to deal with that pushback. Yeah, you got to deal with it. The, the younger students, like the B, my students in BU, it's really difficult for them because they just, they're just, they're like, but just tell us what to do and we'll do it. Yeah, well. well then it's my script. You know. <laughs> but that's, you know, they're in college and they want, you know, they want, you know, very set rules and regulations. And from 1992 to 1996, you worked with Ben Stiller quite a bit, uh, working on the Ben Stiller show from 92 to 93 and then starring Reality Bites in 94. And then my all time five favorite cable guy in 96. I, I worked with Judd and Ben on other things that did not get made. Like we wrote, I wrote a movie that was close to getting made and called Spies and Innkeepers. So it got greenlit and then it, and then it didn't, and then it got greenlit again. And it was like one of those things that could change your life, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, they did Cable Guy and they, you know, they had a basketball scene and I was playing a lot of ball at the time. We, <laughs> I was. Yeah. No, I'm laughing at it as a classic scene. It was, yes. Joel Murray is in that scene and, a, and Joel and I were on some sort of, it, Joel had organized, uh, that's Bill Murray's brother, Joel. Very good actor, very good. Um, he's on a ton of stuff, uh, really good stuff. And um, so he, he had organized sort of a, a Second City team of, of people who had been in Second City. And um, so we had this like little team and we got together and played and we just played like every week and it was really fun. And um, I guess Ben was like, well, why don't you guys just do this? You know, we have a basketball scene. So why don't you come in and do the scene? Yeah. So I got to have a like a 
a, a shot with Jim Carrey, which was really fun. Um, go, going from Reality Bites to The Cable Guy, Reality Bites seemed to be like significantly more on an independent level than The Cable Guy. Was there was yeah. there a noticeable difference from well, the set? Judd and, Judd and Ben rewrote the script for Cable Guy, right? So that's a reflection of their way where they were at the moment in comedy, right? Where Judd and Ben as writers, producers, and then Ben as a director, that's their kind of vision. Reality Bites was written by a really great writer, Helen Childress, who Ben still admires. Um, she had written this script uh, it was with Jersey Films, which was with Stacey Scher, was one of the uh, producers, and Danny DeVito. Um, and yeah, it had. I think they liked it because it had that. Um, you know, she she was um, from Houston, and um, she said it in Houston, and I think that that's what they liked about it. You know, that was the that was Helen's sort of vision. And interestingly enough, I ended up doing a show in Texas with the creator of, this, uh, of a show uh, with these three guys in Austin. I did a show called Austin Stories, which yeah. reminded me very much of Reality Bites, but a few years later, I did it in 97. We did 13 episodes. Again, this was for MTV, believe it or not. Um, and that was like a single camera show, slice of life show about these slackers in, in Austin. It was really fun and, and the people in it were really good, very ahead of its time type of a show. And I think, yeah, that's what Helen's thing was. And I think Ben, what he did, what he tried to do with it, what, what he added to it was that, um, wasn't there like a trial that was going on with a child star? That's Ben. Okay. So he sort of married a Ben look at, um, sort of a comical look at contemporary life because he was blending the agent character that he was or whatever with within the world of these coming of age, you know, people, this Gen X, whatever they, the millennials, I think they were millennials at that time. So mm -hmm. Helen's like this millennial person writing about her generation, kind of like, you know, uh, girls years later. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so they're very different movies, right? So one's a very high concept movie with Jim Carrey, which which was kind of, you know, and the other one is a very sort of lo-fi movie. Yeah, yeah, cool. And I don't think either one of them would be made <laughs> anymore <laughs> by a studio. Yeah, definitely. You brought up uh, you brought up earlier how, like you say, originally you wanted to be an actor, and of course it led, led into your love for writing. But you did get to do some acting, and you brought up the name Jim Carrey earlier. And of course, you're in the classic basketball scene in the Cable Guy, watching Jim Carrey Carrey ridiculously warm up for the game. He's known for yeah. really getting all the way. I'm talking about, talk about yeah. method. He gets into his roles. I mean, 100. percent What was it like working with him on set and playing an iconic character like the Cable Guy? I love. I always felt like when you do comedy that you have to approach it like that. I mean, that was, that's not like bizarre for me for somebody to go all in. Right. Yeah. And, and be like, this is my character. And cause I came from a world where you create your characters, you're in you. It's like the way an actor creates a character. Right. I mean, that's what he's doing. Right. He gets all in and he's, and Ben is the same way, you know, uh, you know, he, it's like, that's the way. And I, I appreciated the approach that Ben took the seriousness that he took about comedy, which is funny, right? That he and I were very serious about comedy. And so is Jim Carrey. Like it wasn't, yeah, he's really funny and he knows what's funny, but he's serious about it, mm -hmm. right? So I wanted to match his intensity, right? So I had to create my own straight man character, right? Whatever it is, like it's pretty much just like, you know, a guy who's really way too serious about basketball. And he, you know, he's doing this thing and it's like really funny, but it's like, he's all in. He's in it. Yeah, I love that man. And that was like that was his first time kind of dipping his toes in a in a darker Dark. side of comedy. Yeah. yeah. That, so other than in Living Color. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying. I'm just there. saying. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's my first time referencing it. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, and was that on that set? Is that where you met your ex-wife, Annabelle? No. No, I knew okay, Annabelle. I just I noticed she was in there. And it no, we were of... already. Uh, uh, we were. I met Annabelle in 1990. Okay. So I had known her for a long time before 
we by the, by by the cable guy we were um, going out for serious for the we were serious or like we we're about to be engaged or whatever it's certain because we got we or we were engaged because we got married in 96 okay so no i did not meet her then because that would have been really quick <laughs> i met her yeah. in cable guy and we're getting married in three months i, I knew her for it seemed like I, I i knew her for five years and that that's what the book is about really it's about the book that we wrote uh, uh, is about the courtship the elongated strange courtship and story and it culminated five years later and getting married and and you know this life yeah that's a that's a perfect segue actually the next question in in that was 2010 where when you co-wrote guys co-wrote the book together it's called you say tomato i say shut up <laughs> um and i i guess can you tell us a, a little bit about what that what the first what the book was what the book is kind of about and and what that was like because what i from what i read it was ultimately like a memoir it well, is. It, it is. It's a it's a memoir. Okay. That's what it would be classified as a nonfiction memoir, but it, it told in two different points of view. So it's a okay. he said, she said, and so what we what we how we came to the idea, which is that the thesis was that two people could be in the same place at the same time and even in the same marriage and have two completely different experiences about what was happening. And that just, that was us, right? Some people get married and they have this very sort of, you know, co-point of view. And we had polar opposite points of view. Mm. And I think that happens too, right? So there's something universal about it. Mm. So what happened was, is that I, I both Annabelle and I wrote uh, first person kind of comedic essays um, that were, you know, life-based for a show that Jill Soloway, now Joey Soloway, uh, created called um, Sit and Spin, which was a which is was connected to um, Comedy Central uh, in their workspace, and then writers, mainly writers, would go and tell their first person stories to an audience. Um, and it's been it was you know up until the pandemic, it was going for it was like twenty seven years of this stuff. So I wrote. A, an essay called, uh, it sounds awful now, Back to the I know I like it. I, like uh, it. I don't know if you, I, I, I don't think you can say the P word any longer. Sure. Yeah, um, no, I, that I, I won't say it any longer, but it was essentially what it was about was about how the labyrinth of different things I had to go through in order to have sex with my wife. And this is in the book? Yeah, this was what started the book. So I wrote this piece about just just how incredibly difficult and trying it was, and the frustration and and insanity it it it, it and, and and that it elicited in my response. And it you know went over very big, but I, all, she was on the bill and had no idea I was doing that that night because it was like a surprise. And so she came out and she was like, "My husband, the great fiction writer." <laughs> so she was like i can't she's we're very, we had a very competitive marriage um which i don't advise anybody to have so she wrote a counter to that which was like why and from that it snowballed into this book of like how do we look at um sex how do we look at finance how do we look at parenting how do we look at sh sh grocery shopping how do we look at um the future how do we look at finances it and so it's just like I would write my, I, you know, or how do we, how do we see our courtship? You know, I saw it this very romantic way and she just thought it as like, he's nuts. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so we have this back and forth in the book and that naturally sort of segued into us performing it. And that became a play. Oh, nice. And so we developed a play, a theatrical play that had a run of like over five years but we were the ones who initiated the characters. So it's my ex and I on stage recreating our book that recreated our marriage. That, so we're, we're actually in scenes from our own marriage acting in the past. And it was like, whoa. So meta. Like, so, meta. So, so meta. And then somebody else and was like, well, we're not going to do this any longer because we can't, you know, we have a kid to, to raise and we can't be on the road like that. Um, 
So two other people became Jeff and Annabelle. I do. I have. A, I have a follow-up question, and please feel free to just say skip it if you want to. But I want to. I want to get ahead of any comments out there. Or if, like somebody like I don't want to pick this book up, but like because it didn't work out for them. Almost like the guy who was the founder of Herbalife dying from health-related issues. Mm-hmm. Could I, do you mind if I ask what what happened? Well, I think in the book, it, it, we all say through the book, like, look, we're probably going to get divorced. So, and we also say th- the thing that you have to learn from this book is very simple do not have a marriage like ours we're very frank so it's a cautionary tale yeah it's a cautionary tale okay Okay. i think anybody who reads it knows will not be surprised that the two people who wrote it are no longer together if you want to find out how to avoid divorce talk to somebody who's been through it that's that's, yeah (laughs) solid it's only i i I only say that in 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 with with a lot of good feelings um and uh about annabelle and how talented she is um of a writer and a performer i want to ask i want to back up a little bit um it's it's 1997 uh you're back you're back at mtv and we talked about this earlier you're producing a show called austin stories and A fan of the show, I don't know if you see, I know we both check IMDb, but a fan of the show wrote one of the best shows MTV has ever had on their network. Now, Austin Stories, as you know, was put to bed well before its time, and I can agree to that too. But usually any type of show on MTV or uh, I believe Netflix calls it a limited series, whenever they have these things and they get put to bed early, there's usually some type of behind the scenes story. Was there a story to this or that you can remember or that you can tell us? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, you know, some things are just not, the, the, the audience that it's for, the MTV audience, is just not ready for that kind of a show. Yeah. Uh, and I cannot remember what was going on exactly with MTV at that point. Would Comedy Central have been a better fit? Probably. It was a very indie show. It was shot in 16 millimeter. Uh, it was a very slice of life show. Uh, it had three lead characters who were um, just post-college uh, this would be, I, I guess that does, does that make them millennials or Gen X? I can't remember in 97. Right. It's one, it's one of those. Right. Yeah. And there's slackery. There's like a slackery character. There's a guy who's not yet come, come came out as you know, gay. And then there's a more pragmatic uh, uh, female character who actually has a job and is trying to become an adult, uh, albeit really slowly. Um, Austin at that time was sort of like the, the heart of the, that slacker kind of idea. Mm-hmm. I just think that they weren't, we had a produ- we had a executive at MTV. It's, it's probably boring for people, but there was an executive there, a wonderful um, person. And she left there to, to, to do it, to go to Fox. And I think sometimes when you lose your, your champion, right? The person that is championing your show, which is a hard sell on their network, you kind of, you lose the steam. Like then the network was like, there's nobody there that's like championing you. And, yeah. you know, we, that's what happened to the, to the Ben Stiller show as well, which is that uh, Peter Chernin was the head of Fox at the time. He was a champion of the Ben Stiller show on Fox and um, uh, Stephen Grushow, believe his name is, uh, took over after Chernin left and he was not a fan of the show, to say the least. And the end of the show. And I think that's what happened to a certain extent. They have trouble finding an audience for Austin Stories or trouble sort of marketing it or you know giving it a brand. And they just didn't have that executive there that was working to make it happen. Yeah, and where the show gets put in the time slot could be the last nail in the coffin. I, we talked to Brad Copeland, he did the in-betweeners on MTV, and that that ended up dying before its time because they put it right after ridiculousness, and nobody was wanting to see scripted comedy after watching a show like right. America's Funniest Home Videos. He was like, on, put it on before, right, maybe, right, yeah. and then, yeah. The the Fox Spencer show uh, went up against 60 Minutes at 7 o'clock. It's, it's just, it just it was the... It was the wrong time. Yeah. Absolutely. And then sometimes if you move the show to the right time, like they move Seinfeld to, to, the, to that time slot on Thursdays and all of a sudden they got eyes, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. it's, there's so much luck involved. Yeah. But I think you do, if you lose your champion, 
on, on marginal shows, like shows that are more ahead of their time. Like I came back from doing Austin stories in, in 97 and I, and a lot of people, uh, for instance, uh, Matt, the creator of the Simpsons mm -hmm. and Larry Charles, uh, the great director and writer um, and provocateur, brilliant, near genius type of a man. I met with both of those guys. They loved it. You know, they wanted me to write for their shows. So mm -hmm. it, it had, you know, I remember Larry Charles said to me, he was like, Larry, David and I want to make a show like that. And it, they did curb, but you know, it was just, it was ahead of its time and it was not really on the right network. Cause the, cause people who watch MTV, I don't think we're mature enough to give a shit about post-college kids who were trying to find their way in the world, you know, and still have fun. Yeah. Switching gears just a little bit in the two thousands, you played a, a, a lot of supporting characters uh, from the Larry Sanders show, Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, Crooked Lines, Entourage, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, and Drillbit Taylor. Was there a particular character from that time that was like, that was the most satisfying for you to bring to life? They're so small, you know, that, I mean, they're just so, they're just little, the one that I, the one that's the most fun that, that I get the most, I guess, joy of thinking back to doing is the the 40 year old virgin of all the parts all the little tiny roles tiny little roles that i've done that's the most fun because it was the most challenging and i think i got the most bang for the buck out of it the scene is improvised um i have to do a scene with brilliant david keckner and the really funny dude from the state who did the um, Reno 911, I forgot his name. And Steve Carell's very funny wife, who's the head, who's the therapist of that. And, you know, they gave kids lines to say, and then they let the fathers riff. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm in a league here. I'm mm -hmm. a C D player. <laughs> And I'm in, I'm in an A league and I got to up my game. And uh, luckily Judd allowed me to um, flex some of my improvisational muscle. And I got, I got some laughs out of that. So that was the most fun. And I think the fondest of my, all of all my little tiny parts. <laughs> Judd Apatow seems like the ultimate performers director or comedians director that really lets them explore the space for as a, as far as a comedian goes now I, I know you said there were little tiny parts but we we spoke with lisa gardinsky early in, uh, last season and she talked to us about one of the things i heard you mention this earlier that one of the things that she spoke on was even though she's an actress she learned so much more that it was invaluable that she got come she got asked to be um come in and audition not audition to be one of the cat to be, review the people that are coming into audition and she said she learned so so much from watching these people audition so let me ask you this you being in these parts and you call them small parts but i know you still have a passion for acting what's what are some of the tips and trips tips and tricks that you've learned from set to set to set you mentioned it earlier learning this or writing these invaluable things right. what is something you can give to an actor being on all these different sets well it's the same thing it's i had a teacher at um uh bennington uh my first term uh, a great writer david gates amazing writer. And he had this thing and he said, you know, look, whether you're writing a short story or a novel, any character you introduce believes that that short story or novel is about them. And I was like, yes, of course. Cause that's exactly how I feel when I'm on camera. Yes, <laughs> That's exactly how I feel. Like once I'm there on camera, it is the Jeff Kahn movie for those yes, yes. two yes. seconds. I am the star of that movie. And that's how I, I do it. Cause I like, I'm, you know, it's so rare that I get to do it. And it's such an honor for me to be, uh, to, to be invited onto a set to do a part in a major motion picture. It's such an yeah. honor. And it's so like, like a fantasy, like, you know, it's like, now it's my movie for these two seconds. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to be in a scene with Jim Carrey, it's like, it's me and Jim starring in this basketball moment. And it's ridiculous, but you know, that's how I approach it. I think that's a, I think that's a good approach. Yeah, there are no small roles. Like, I'm, I'm stepping into a big novel, but I don't know it's war and peace. 
I think it's like the, <laughs> it's the it's the character who gets shot in this in this in this battle, and how important it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a good a great approach to it because that's where you get those those bit parts in movies where it's memorable. You could tell that that yeah. person was bringing everything to the table as if it was yeah. as if they were the headliner. Take a picture; it'll last longer. Yeah, exactly. See, they said like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, one of the smallest parts in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles was Andrew Hentz in the bus telling Steve Martin to take a picture it'll last longer. It's yeah. a, a, As a child, that part stuck he with me. He still gets residual checks for that to this day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, uh, Jonah Hill has a small part in, in Four-Year-Old Virgin. The boots. Like, the boots. That's Why can't right. I just buy them here? That's his career started there. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. All right, let's talk about Tropic Thunder. The so this was Ben Stiller's satire on acting, on 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 filmmaking in general, and it was done brilliantly for anybody that's been on a set. You can the the nuance is there. You're featured early in the film. You you play the uptight waiter in the uh, in the Fatties French trailer. Waiter. French waiter. Yes, French. Very really, yes. <laughs> yes, and very very well played as well. <laughs> so when you're shooting a trailer. I was curious when I saw this. Is it scripted as we see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's, it's... scripted as a trailer. So, the, uh, I was lucky, super lucky, because I actually got to work a couple days punching that movie up with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, there was like a room with really funny people. So, I knew the script before I, before I was asked, before Ben asked me, come in and do this, you know, French waiter thing. Um, so they, they, they wrote the trailers like trailers. And that's the, that's sort of the teaser of the, uh, right. Uh, of, of the movie itself. I believe it's the first scene. You are the first actor we see on screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's funny. So that's why it's so now I remember. So, so my yes. name, my name comes up first in the credits. That was astonishing. Because when I, when I went to the screening and, they, and the credits come up, it says Jeff Kahn. So yeah, so yeah, it's written the, the different trailers for the different, um, and they were also what? Parroting trailers, right? Yes. The, the, the big movie, the what, what, uh, Eddie Murphy cool. playing every different role. And then the, the art movie where the two guys, the Brokeback Mountain. Kind Things of, Alley. Yeah. Saint Sally, <laughs> but what was it? Was that the one where there were medieval monks? Yeah, Tom to McGuire yes. and RDJ going yeah. at it. You know, so funny. <laughs> I'd that one I loved. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd, go, I'd go see it. That's really fun. So yeah, so yeah, that's and because of that, that that scene actually took a couple days to shoot it. It was you know because because uh, Jack had to come out and do the different characters and reshoot the scene for in every different character's pov what is your beats like as you know again you come from world you've improv you've done scripted but let me ask you this right. what is it like when like you say all these characters are being cut up in different and like and you having to well that's a whole different thing than like judge scene okay. like that's okay. a real technical scene right so 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 jack has to get into you know his makeup um and do the one fatty do those do, do those lines and then and then has to do the takes when the other characters say the lines, right? So that's still on daddy fatty. I'm, I can't even remember all the different, there was like a daddy or mom fatty and a sister. Um, yeah. And so then if he's the daddy fatty, then he does his lines as daddy fatty. And then he's got to do his close-ups of the, when he's reacting to other people, mm -hmm. right? And then switch, Jack is now the sister, and then the sister does her lines and then she's got to do it. And then they put it all together. And Judd's thing is like, basically the, the, you know, the wide shot of what's happening, right. Uh, with the parents from, I guess, over the shoulder of, of Steve Carell's wife, uh, forgot her name, but she's brilliant. Um, and then the three different setup close-ups of the parents and the kids, you know, the Keckner does his thing with his kid and then um great state actor guy um he does his with his daughter and then on me yeah and so it's a much easier scene the fatty scene is is very complicated and there's a lot of like little you know there was a camera crew that did the close-ups of the 
of the hand, my hand and the hitting a glass. And so there's a crew doing that. And then there's another, so like two crews are shooting at the same time to get mm -hmm. everything done. You know, Ben's, you know, it's a really good filmmaker and he's very, um, he thinks like a filmmaker as you can, you know, you can see in MIDI. I mean, yeah, he, I mean he really has a visual is, sense. He's very it's, different, you know, Judd's more, more like, I'm going to tell the story, right? I'm going to tell yeah. the story and I'll let the actors kind of. I mean, Tropic yeah, Thunder yeah. is, is not only was he f flexing his amazing body that I did not know he had, <laughs> but he was oh, also, he was also flexing his directing skills and oh, yeah. filmmaking skills. Cause you could put that movie up with the wartime movies that it is yeah. parody. It is, yeah. it is the cinematography. I mean, John Toll, uh, I mean, John Toll is going on to do Matrix 4. So, yeah. I mean, the, it's It's there. almost like the most serious, funny action movie military-wise ever. And because it's, it's not shot as if a joke. No, no, no. Like but, ben, but that's what, that's Ben's thing, right? That's, and Ben's idea of comedy, it's serious, right? Mm -hmm. Even though it's a parody and a satire, you know, there's parody elements in it and it's very satirical uh, about Hollywood, about filmmaking, about actors, about, um, agents about the world behind, you know, the, the sort of behind the scenes world of that. And, and, and there's even high farce in that, you know, with, with him doing, acting out the character for the, for the people in the, in the drug camp. Like, so there's a lot going on, but e even within all of that comedy, you know, he wants to make it look great. Mm -hmm. He's yes. always wanted to make those shots to make the product look good all the way back to Elvis stories. He is very insistent on how it was going to look. Saw himself as a director, you know, first. Right. I do know That's that. what he wanted to do, you know, and that the acting and the writing was all supposed to be supplemental to, to this thing that he, that he really wanted to be a, a great director. I, I did read up on it. L let me ask you this, because you, you went into great detail earlier about how complicated that scene was, like you, as you remember, it's like trying to cut into different crews, working all together to make sure that shot happened. But out of all of the intros, all of the parody of the, the trailers in the beginning, that's the one that most feels a reminiscent of a real skit, a trailer and sketchy type feel like what you guys deal with the, with the Ben Stiller show. So yeah, it, yeah. It, it, was there any I moments while they were the filming? Yeah, the yeah I mean, that's the high feel? concept comedy, right? Okay, yes, yes. Right. So they wanted to do, they wanted to create different stars who were stars for different reasons and then blend them into the, into the one movie, mm -hmm. right? So they, instead of like expositionally telling the background, like you're, you're the guy who does the stupid fatty movies, you know, it's show don't tell, right? That's right. Right, so show, they show them in who they are before we meet them. So we know these guys what are not going to get along and they're not going to see filmmaking the same way right without was, any exposition was there ever a moment while you were doing that where like between uh you and ben where it's like this is like the old days i don't have a lot of ben was really busy but what i did have time to do was to improvise play around like there's a lot of downtime jack and mm -hmm. i i would be not me the french guy I was doing like i had a character in my head like as i said like i'm like this guy who's not working as an actor and he does a French accent. And so he gets this role and I had a whole thing in my head and to do, so I could do this character, right? Yeah. So he wouldn't be Jeff Kahn. So he'd be some other guy. And so I'm just playing around with Jack. Like, we're just like, I would talk to him as if he was the sister, the real sister. And I'm oh, like, you, look, you know, it's like, and I'd be like, kind of cute. <laughs> and, and Jack would be like, no. And I'm like, yeah, no, you are you're hot and so we're like between takes i'm talking to his character and my character man he doesn't break till dvd <laughs> commentary <laughs> yeah that's so you're just a guy playing, playing a, a guy, guy playing, playing a guy, guy. yeah there All you right. go that's a my perfect God. that's a uh, perfect segue what was it like working with jack black that's it it was fun he's really fun i i knew i knew jack for a long time you know i, I was peripheral uh, performer in the actors gang which was tim robbins theatrical mm -hmm. group that Jack was a part of. I got to work with them a little bit. And then John Cusack developed, uh, created his own theatrical group in Chicago called um, New Crime Players, New Criminals, I believe. And which, and so it was based on Commedia d'arte, which is a 
way of acting that I, a style of acting from the Italian Renaissance that we learned that Tim was doing and then John wanted to do it. And, Bla and Jack was a part of that uh, company. And so I, I knew Jack for a long time. Um, I had sort of saw Jack go from a guy, Jack auditioned for me when I was, and my writing partner, Aline Brash, who became Aline Brash McKenna, the amazing, brilliant writer who um, created Crazy Ex-Girlfriend and also wrote The Devil Wears Prada uh, with a, I, again, I worked with her for five years too, and she's doing all right for herself. So, um, <laughs> She's, she's absolutely brilliant. And I can't believe we haven't talked about it because she's, uh, and, I, and she put me on Crazy Ex-Girlfriend too. So I got to be in that show twice. Oh, fair um, So um, he auditioned for us several times, but he was very shy. He seemed to be either shy or he didn't really want the part or, because we really loved him and we wanted him to do it, but he, we couldn't get him past the network. Yeah. But they would say, yeah, he seems a little green. And we're like, no, he's, he's really good. <laughs> he's going to be a major star. <laughs> um, he's not green he's just shy um, yeah. so wow. yeah I would I'd ask I, I would ask Jack to come and audition for our pilots and then you know then he became a huge star now the so the movie deals with a lot with the pretentiousness the self-importance that actor that it's commonly associated with actors and we don't want to throw any anybody in particular under the bus. I don't, I'm not looking for like a name or anything like that. But is there a situation that you could recall um, that you could share that proves the existence of people like Tug Speedman or Kirk Lazarus, like an overly self-important individual? Let's just say those people couldn't play those people unless they knew that they were those people. Yeah, mm. self-aware. Who doesn't do that? They all do it. We all do. The, we all, it's like attaching a self-importance to what you do. I mean, it's just like, it's so much a part of it. It's always been a part of Hollywood that people take themselves very seriously and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that they attach an incredible amount of significance to the work that they do, you know? Yeah. Some of it is warranted, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, you know, if they're the lead in a movie, there's a, you know, the, you know, there's a lot of pressure to be put, you know, asses in the seats to be a major right. motion picture star is a tremendous amount of pressure. Yes. They're incredibly compensated and they're indulged and, you know, but when you need to perform and you need to be the greatest, I mean, like, look, look at Tom Cruise who's amazing in Tropic Thunder, yes. by the way. Yeah. So funny. Yes. He steals the movie. Um, yeah. He never gives anything less than a thousand percent. I mean, I'm sure there's nobody that takes themselves more seriously than Tom Cruise. Yeah. I don't think I'm speaking out of school here. <laughs> but uh, the guy brings it. Yeah. Okay, he just like, he's great. My my wife does not is not a Tom Cruise fan, and she she likes him in that movie. His hands she, are so good. So funny. He's, yeah, was he was the funniest person in the table read, and okay. everybody in the world is at that table read, and Tom Cruise gets the biggest laugh. Okay, now that's the table read. So let me ask you this: now this this movie did had did not short for talent. I mean, even people from from the, just the smallest character to the smallest parts. I mean, one word characters. Everybody had their moments. Let me ask you this: Who was your favorite character? You know, I've, I saw it a bunch of times, and I think each time I might groove on some new character. I I mean, of course, I loved this, is, and you could never do this now. And I don't even know if it's even. <laughs> It's so bad. Shake that shit up, man. What what's his name? The 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 Australian uh, the, um, <laughs> actor that was playing. He's in blackface. He's in blackface. The pigmentation surgery. <laughs> yes, that performance is so good, though. Yeah. It's so subtle yeah. and amazing, and yes, and he's just he's so he's so good. It's so yeah. wrong, and <laughs> it's so good. But is it wrong though? Because we talked we talk about it. when I watched this the first time, I didn't know it was him. I completely did not know it was him the entire time. So good. Yeah. Yeah. And we, so we, we had this discussion on Martin Luther King Day. We did. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know what to say about it because 
It's, it, it, you know, I had, I have a, a, a relative who took a considerable offense to the quote, going full, mm -hmm. not my line, not saying that it's in the script. Um, took a, a considerable offense and thought it was horrible mm -hmm. that, uh, that mental illness was treated that way. And I, I was trying to explain to him, it's like, no, see what he's making fun of not mental illness. He's making fun of Hollywood types who don't understand right. mental illness. And, and so create these ridiculous, stereotypical, horrible uh, caricatures of it. And he's like, not funny. So like, okay, all right, I'm not, I'm not. Satire yeah. is a very dangerous ground for comedy, especially nowadays where something yeah. can easily be, sound bites can be grabbed and things can be taken out of context. And there are people that get upset with like Always Sunny in Philadelphia because they hear that blackface is featured in an episode. They don't bother to watch the episode and understand mm -hmm. that they're trying to pr convey that this is something that is ridiculous to do, mm -hmm. leading by example. But then I was saying like, you know, the other times I watched it and I would be like, really like just grooving out on 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 steve Coog, uh, Co uh, kogan's kogan's yeah Co i believe it's kogan it's cool. yeah. it's cool. right I, I just like i just because i love him and, and and i just like and i was like you know what that even though he gets blown blown up um he just kills me in the beginning of that yeah. right he's just so funny and and then of course tom cruise character Oh, yeah, man. the whole way through, you know, uh, as less, uh, what's his Grossman. name? Grossman. 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 Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever known an agent as good as Matthew McConaughey? The Pecker. Well, I mean, I've known agents who have been good to their clients, but not to me. <laughs> I've never had an agent that was that good to me who would die for me. I've had agents sort of fight for me a little bit, like try to mm -hmm. keep me in their dead but i've also like you know had agents that fired me too so nobody's bringing uh, a tivo out to vietnam for you yet though <laughs> uh yeah They're, yeah agents are funny i you know my i had a fun i had this story that when i was working on with tim robbins uh on the actors gang J jack was in, in this production but um it was at this theater in in la it's close that used to have good up there on Sunset Boulevard called Tiffany and they were doing a, a show and I was understudying it, right? And I was also being a PA. Um, so I was helping them out, getting them stuff and, you know, for like 50 bucks a week and selling t-shirts outside and feeling pretty lucky to be associated with um, Tim Robbins Actors Gang. It's a famous right. theater, even yeah. back then. And so I got to go on a few times and it was really fun. And after one of the times a guy came up to me and he said, you know, I really like what you did. You have a very unique look and I'm an, I'm a talent agent and here's my card. Send me your photo resume. Cause we didn't have internet then. So I had to send it in the mail and uh, we'll uh, I'll give it to my people there. And if we like it, we'll call you in and we'll meet with you. And I'm like, great. Cause that's what I came out to do. Mm -hmm. So a couple of weeks later, I get a call um, Martin Gage wants to see you, uh, wants to introduce you to the other agents. And so can you come in a blah, blah, blah day? Uh, and I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get an LA agent. It's all happening for Jeff Kahn. So I go to see him and he's like, you know, this is Jeff Kahn. He's got a really unique look. He's done some commercials. He's in the actor's gang. Unique looking guy, right? He said like, yeah, we love him. Like, you know, what a funny re comedy reel. And then he brings me in his office. And I really like your reel, very unique. Uh, you're a very unique guy. You should know that. My, my only problem is, is that I got five guys just like you. So I can't bring you on right now. But if you get a part on a TV show or a lead in a movie, then you got to call me because we were really. But that's, that's, my, that's your job. That's his job. And what does that mean? Hey, you're really unique, but we got five guys just like you. No, I'm not. That means that translates to this. Um, I've just wasted your time for no reason. I can't get work for the other guys that remind me of you. And if I have five guys that look 
and remind me of you, then there's got to be at least 20,000 other Jeff Kahn's in Hollywood. Probably the guy that uh, wrote and directed Astonished and Revolution. <laughs> and so good luck to you. But if you happen to crap, you know, luck out and, and win the lottery and get a lead in a movie, I want to <laughs> Give me that percentage. I was so dumbfounded by, by that comment. I was literally, I was literally, like when your stomach sinks, right? And you, I was without comment. I don't know what to say. Like, why did you, I was like, this is the last thing I thought he was gonna say, like, we're, maybe we're gonna hip pocket you and send you out on commercials and see how you do. Like, I was like, that was my low, that was my low expectation. Like, that they're not gonna sign me per se, but they will bring me right. on to hip pocket me and see if I can right. get some work. And if I could generate some income, then they would, they would, you know, sign me, you know, for a year and give me a break. But to be completely brought in and not completely carpet and take it out from under my feet, I was just like, I was deer in the headlights and I just walked out going past people. And I guess they knew because nobody looked at me as I'm doing oh my the God. walk of shame. That's hell, they knew before he went in. Wait, didn't, didn't that guy just leave? We saw somebody else come in. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, God. he just, just looked just like him. Jesus Christ, man. Wow. So with, um, it's with rough Tropic out there, man. <laughs> with Tropic Thunder, I know you talked about you know staying in character with Jack Black. Was there like a favorite uh, favorite memory that you have from that set? My favorite memory from the set is that Anne and Jerry were there. So that's mm -hmm. my favorite memory. Because whenever I saw Jerry and Anne, I felt like I was a kid again back in New York and living with Ben. And those were my New York parents. Yes. And I loved them. And and they loved me and they were so nice and supportive and loving to me and that they were both there. Um, and, you know, and I got to talk to them and hang out with them and hug them and kiss them and talk to Jerry, who was always such a supporter of mine. And Anne was always so funny. I, I actually uh, got to punch up a movie that Anne was in once too. And I got to see her on set as well. And that was, that to me was the big treat. And I got to, you know, spend like a day of kicking it with, with Jerry and Anne, my, you know, people who opened up their arms and heart to me when I was in New York. And, and uh, I'm forever grateful to them and to Ben for that. That's something I've always appreciated about Ben Stiller's films is it feels like a family affair. Like it, it feels mm -hmm. like a very close knit set where he has people that are close to him always involved in some kind of way. So it must make for a really um just a really positive atmosphere in the production harry balstein <laughs> zoolander let me ask you this before we finally move on from tropic thunder is there anything right. else you think the fans of the film may appreciate knowing something you picked up or something they may not know this out there if not because you've discussed it in nauseam but i just want to think well i think it's really i just think it's so funny that these people like you you know like ben always was vain about <laughs> not out of school here he's always like a really cut guy yeah. i was surprised because i i'm like Greg Fokker. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. Well, under underneath those sweaters, chiseled. Yeah. And but he always comes off with this air of like the awkward guy. And right. to see like how are that how are you you are a good actor. If you can play awkward or yeah. not self assured and be working with that underneath the shirt. Yeah, cut. Always yeah, in really good great. shape. Uh though I I, I I was always better than him in one on one basketball. It's the only thing I could win at with him. So no. I, I used to really, I really used to take him apart. Let me ask you this now. Of course, uh, this is a little bit of a switch, at least for us. But you started writing. You've written for the Huffington Post. You've written scripts and you've written a novel. Is there a particular form of writing that you prefer? Is it just you love writing? I love writing, but I just heard somebody. Oh, I know who it was. Um, Fran, Fran uh, Leberwitz say, any writer who loves writing is not a good writer. And so I heard that and I was like, oh God, well, maybe that's my problem. Um, I do love writing. It's very hard to write. I, I didn't, you know, I started my, I wrote a memoir, so it's a nonfiction. Um, and then I began writing a novel, trying to learn how to write a novel when I was in grad school as an old man. <laughs> so I, cause I was like, I've never written a novel before, you know? And so I, you know, it's very, it's hard. It, it, it's really hard uh, to write anything. Um, I enjoy partnerships in writing. 
you know, I've had Ben as a partner and I had a lean and I, and, and, and uh, my God, how lucky is that to work with two absolutely top of the game, a listing, brilliant, um, no one better than people. Like I got to work with them both. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I just, I, I, and I like working with students because I feel like even though it's not my script, it's their script, I'm still working on a script, right? Yeah. I'm still working on, on a television uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. And so even the act of writing or being a teacher, to trying to teach somebody how to be a writer is, is fun for me. Maybe I love it too much. Maybe that's my problem. Um, <laughs> but it is hard. And you know, writing alone, you know, writing with a partner, especially comedy can be really fun and um, make the hours fly. And sometimes writing alone can be very sort of isolating, especially with comedy, because you, you don't know, like, is this funny or not? Like, like yeah. I always knew what was funny because, you know, even if Ben, because Ben wouldn't laugh, but he would go like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. And then he'd be like, then he'd be look at me and go, that, why, why'd you write that? that's what is that funny to you and i'd be like no no it's not i don't know why i wrote it i'm, I'm, I'm terrible fire me i <laughs> like it's frightening you know but i knew it's like he'd be like funny and then i knew it was good and aline would laugh yeah she would i you know if, if i made aline laugh i was like that's funny i know it's funny but so, when you're alone like it's hard to tell it's such a you know it's yeah. tough work yeah that that's um, I, on your instructor page on uh, UCLA. There's actually a quote that I thought was pretty great. It said it, you, about writing. You said it's hard work, and it's totally worth it. So I was I'm curious. What would it? What would you say is the biggest challenge that makes writing hard work, and what makes it totally worth it for you? The the hardest thing about writing is that because of our egos, we think that the first thing that we write is the thing, right? So mm -hmm. the real hard thing about writing is like, even after like pilot writing is different because you, you have to create an entire show. So that's just hard. This is yeah. playing out hard. But script writing is that the first draft is just, blah, you know, it's rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And do you have the discipline and do you have the focus and do you have the energy and do you have the lack of ego to be able to say like, you know what, this was good two weeks ago. It's not that good right now. Mm -hmm. Somebody like working with somebody like Ben taught me that because, because I'd be like, this is so good. And Ben would be like, mm, I don't, I don't, this is, I don't, maybe we should just throw it out. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, what, you know, but he's right. It's like, just, you got to, that's what the hardest thing is. It's like, you think what you write is brilliant because you wrote it and it seemed really good in the moment. It can be better and yeah. it can always be better. And that's really hard. I think if you're honest with yourself, the longer that you're doing it and the more you go back and cause that something that I've learned, like when I, when making movies is um, the latest thing is always the best thing. But then yeah. I go back and watch what I thought was my best thing in 2004, and I wouldn't show it to anybody now. So right. Well, you can only be who you are in that time that you write it, right? You can only yeah. be the actor that you are when you acted in that time. You can only be the writer that you are. So, of course, you know, and you do certain things well in different times. Like, you know, Jerry Seinfeld has a book about writing comedy that just came out for writers or for comedians. And it really retraced, uh, I, I saw him being interviewed, and it, he keeps all of his jokes and he sort of like says, this is what I was doing here as a child. And, you know, and, and these are the jokes I wrote here. And here's the jokes I wrote in, you know, 78. And here's the jokes I wrote in 85. And, you know, it's like, yeah, some of it makes him cringe, but then he thought, well, you know, this is who I was then. And this is mm -hmm. what was good for me then. And because mm -hmm. I was able to do that then, I got to the other points of my career. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because since we're on writing, we're almost we're going to let you go here. And I appreciate all the time you've given us okay. the, the joy you get from writing. Is it the same joy that you get when you're teaching some of your students about writing or is it a different feeling altogether? It's pretty similar. I think uh, it's a similar feeling of like being in a, 
artistic process. Mm -hmm. okay. And, um, you know, it, it feels a little different when it's, when I'm creating and I haven't, and I haven't written, uh, I wrote a, uh, I wrote a, a pilot with a lean for a leans company for ABC productions. That was the last thing I did before I left LA. And that was really great and fun for me. And, um, getting to work with Aline again, um, even though it was, I was doing it alone and then I would work it with her in a, in a room, just her and I, that was really fun. I don't think anything is, is as fun as that because it's like your stuff, but it's pretty exciting to work on a young writer's ideas and try to feel like, you know, maybe this guy or maybe this girl, you know, this young person is going to, get to that point where they're going to get, they're going to get work or maybe they're going to get a show on the air someday. Like are, who's going to be the one who's going to be the lucky one out of this group, you know? Yeah, and, right. and I know, and I try to like, you know, it's exciting to hear the ideas. It's exciting to develop concepts. It's, you know, to, to create new characters with them. It's hard because they're, they hold on and they're scared. And, and, and I remember, I remember feeling those things. I remember feeling holding on and scared and not wanting to listen to the feedback that was coming, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, it's challenging to be a teacher in that way. And I also feel like it's also satisfying in an artistic way as well. Yeah. Um, before we let you go, just one final question. Is there anything that we missed um, that you want the audience to know and anything that we should keep our eyes out for? Oh, nothing to keep your eyes out for for me at the moment, except uh, whether or not uh, my girlfriend and I uh, foster adopt a kid, okay. awesome. uh, which is one of our goals. And um, my ex is coming out with a new book, uh, Annabelle. Um, Gerwich is coming out with a new book on February 2nd. Um, uh, I think uh, it's probably the title's out. I want to get the title right. It's um, uh, You're Leaving When? With a question mark. <laughs> okay. uh, my girlfriend is, is writing a book right now. She uh, is another teacher. She's a, a great writer. Uh, she writes um, nonfiction stories. She's published in Three Penny uh, Press. And um, she's writing uh, her first book right now. All right. Um, oh, she's actually, she, she published a, a book a, a while ago when she was really young, uh, a book about phone booths. <laughs> I don't know why, so but I'm brilliant. very she's interested. Like, <laughs> she's so brilliant. She's like, the, she's so much smarter than me. Well, all like, I'm like, it's always Annabelle, but uh, she's really, <laughs> Ariana is really smarter than me. She went to Yale. She has an MFA in poetry and, and this new MFA, because I met her in, in, at Bennington. We were both pledging the same sorority and I didn't, get, uh, I didn't get in, of course, but she felt bad for me. And that's how we started dating. Um, it's good to be so, with somebody uh, who's intellectually superior. Oh my God, yeah. So she <laughs> has two MFAs and she taught at the most prestigious um, high school in, in, in Los Angeles. And now she's teaching at one of the most prestigious boarding schools on the East Coast, you know, super well-read. I mean, she like reads poetry. I, I <laughs> poetry just baffles me. So <laughs> I don't know what to, yeah. I don't know how to uh, even approach it. Well, Mr. Khan, thank you very, very right. much. Well, much hopefully for... this is going to give you enough of me to get you to have your own show uh, yes. on Showtime. I promise we will hold the door open for you if we get through. <laughs> yes, we must. We must. Thank you so much, Jeff. I mean, listen, we love the in your artistic careers. You know, I want to be encouraging to you. I, you know, my being frank is not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, like, do do it. Um, just um, let your, you know, put your ego aside and just uh, take take the blows and keep punching. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, All Jeff. Right. Yes, sir. Thank you for everything. And hey, again, good luck to you and your career. I know your time is coming, sir. Trust me in that because I've said it, it's going to happen. I, I appreciate okay, it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm very happy to be to get a, to get a, a, a recurring role as a teacher in a major university. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh my okay, gosh, I'd be very happy for that. That would be that would be lovely. And best of luck with the adoption process. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you again. You. Have a good night. Bye.
Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer.